Hello and welcome to episode 327 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrodin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this fine day, Bill? I'm amazed that we have 27 episodes in season three, Seth. That's how I am. That's We have way long, long way to go before... 1944 is over. Yeah, man, well, you know, one thing we'll never be accused of, Bill, is being short in the term of, you know, getting words out. Concise? Is that the word you're looking for? <laughs> Thank you, concise. Yes, brevity. There it is. There it is. We cannot be there accused of either brevity or conciseness. Yes. Yes. Conciseness. <laughs> yes. So obviously, if you're watching and or listening, you notice that there are other members of our crew on board for this very, very, very cool episode. John Parshall, our fantastic friend and historian. John, how are you this fine day? I am doing very well. I noticed that your clothing is remarkably similar to the clothing that you were wearing last week. And oh, my gosh, so is mine. Weird. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Very, so is Tony's. So is Bill's. This is a class yeah. with his wallpaper, though, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The wallpaper never gets old, does it? No. And our fourth <laughs> crew member is my esteemed co-author, Anthony Tully. How are you, Tony? Tony? Very good. Enjoyed it. It is, it is great to have you here with us. It is great to have you here with us again and again, you know, People, you, you guys aren't stupid. It's very obvious that we're recording these two episodes on the same day. Yeah, thanks, but I mean, I do have a limited wardrobe. I'm not going to lie. So, I mean, it would, you know, it's quite possible that I would wear this shirt two weeks in a row. But regardless of this, um, we're going to jump right back in where we left off last week, which, of course, is the Battle of Surigao Strait. As, as we left you last week, the PT boats had just finished their attack and they had just pulled away. And the, the true fighting portion of this battle is about to start when the American destroyers get into the fray here. Guys, um, guy we mentioned last last week was a gentleman named Captain Coward, which is a very unfortunate last name because this guy is literally anything okay. but. His Desron 54 is speeding its way south right for Nishimura. Coward had arrayed his destroyers, as we, as you will recall from last week, in two columns, parallel to one another, with the intention of enveloping the Japanese on two flanks. As Coward's destroyers spread south and Nishimura sped north, sped, <laughs> but it, regardless, the two forces sighted each other at a distance of five miles, almost simultaneously. Coward's eastern column was coming in head-on and laid smoke to blur the Japanese vision. Bill take us through some of this early destroyer action here at Surigao Strait. What's going on here? Well, through the smoke screen, Seth, the Japanese could see Coward's column as it came on. The Japanese opened fire, missing wildly, which is unusual. Some of their shell splashes landing more than some 2,000 yards short of their targets. They hadn't bracketed them yet. Even though they had been slight sighted visually, Coward's ships were in a radar shadow zone off the east coast and off the east coast of the western island and were thus invisible to japanese radar according as we might also call it ground clutter in radar parlance according to those shipboard aboard shigure the frustrated japanese could not distinguish the americans from the shore and therefore could see as cowards and therefore could not see as cowards ships Word in. I'm not reading as well as I was reading last week, Seth. <laughs> last week? Last Ten minutes ago, yeah. you mean? <laughs> it's all relative, man. It's fine. It's fine. Mm -hmm. So the Japanese do obviously respond. They open fire on what they thought might be American ships, again, missing badly. Uh, Coward's destroyers, like his plan had stated, held their gunfire. You remember this is this is a tactic of American destroyers that was you know developed out of the Guadalcanal campaign. We see a lot of this off the Solomon Islands in 43. Um, at 0300, 
Coward's destroyers unleash their fish. His eastern column fired 27 torpedoes and torpedoes, and then they turn away. Japanese lookouts, however, spotted the torpedoes inbound and attempted to evade. As the Americans retreated, and this is first blood here. Well, technically not, but it's first blood on the Japanese here. Fuso sighted them and opened fire with her main battery. Star shells lit the night and illuminated the Americans as they pulled away. The battleship, Fuso, scores no hits, and in almost exactly the same time as she opens fire, she absorbs at least two, possibly three torpedoes from USS Melvin. Tony, you had wanted to talk about Melvin and Fuso getting into a little bit of a scrape here. Can you elaborate on this action here for us? Yeah, so what had happened is that as the as as the destroyers were inbound to, about to launch the torpedoes, they were sighted by the Japanese, partly from the role of overhead overhead flares that were up and and uh, visual sightings. And Fuso had time to turn her main batteries and and open fire on Melvin and some some uh, survivors, meaning uh, uh, veterans of Melvin, told me that you know they'd straddle straddle destroyer up, and it was very scary for just you know, you know a few crazy moments the way it is in battle until. The, Torpedoes were seen to hit Fuso, flares on the Fuso, at least two, maybe three. What's interesting about that is that if there's definitely a torpedo hit under the forward turrets on the starboard bow, there's another amidships of some kind because it's where we'll kind of buckle and show damage as she's foundering later. We'll get into that. So it appears to have been in the boiler rooms right behind the pagoda mast. There may have been a third hit, but I, at this time, I don't think so. Uh, so it's probably two torpedo hits, slows Fuso down to 10 knots and starts her listing to starboard. Uh, but she continues after Yamashua for this time. These This time is around 309. So these are torpedoes that were fired from the eastern side of the strait. You're about to describe coward's destroyers firing also from the western side of the strait. But this is the state of the action at this point. Uh, no one seems, other than the cruiser Megami, is falling directly behind Fuso. Yamashiro doesn't see Fuso hit by torpedoes or hear from her. And it appear apparently it's because the forward generator room is one of those things flooded and knocks out her internal communications. So she's not able to telegram Yamashiro right away at all, in fact. So, she continues on. Go ahead, John. You were going to say something? Yep, no, no. That's clear. My oh. Part. Oh, okay. So almost immediately after Fuso is hit, Megami, as you were saying, Tony, slides into column behind Yamashiro. Nishimura riding in the aforementioned battleship was completely unaware that Fuso had fallen out of line and was in desperate trouble. Can can you talk about some of this damage that she suffers? These torpedoes fired from Melvin, uh, which is, by the way, DD-680. Uh, these do some pretty serious damage to Fuso here, right, Tony? I mean, they they put a pretty pretty nasty lick on this battleship. Yes. Uh, if you go back to the air attack, remember that it, one of the bomb hits by the forward turrets penetrated all the way down to a lower deck, and that had probably weakened some structural integrity in that very area. Well, the, the forward torpedo hit goes in under the forward turrets. We have survivors from both uh, number one and number two turret areas. Uh and starts heavy flooding in the bow that is so severe that within about 10, 12 minutes, Fuso's bow is submerging where the waves are being parted by number one turret. I mean, it is going down. You probably described it in your segment before. When Masashi's bow was submerging, right. it's a lot like that. The forecastle was down and like that from massive flooding forward. Mm -hmm. And I believe the bomb damage had added to this. It's I suspect it did because it had done some underwater damage up back the day before. So at this point, you have Fuso basically submerging her bow, leaning more and more to starboard and kind of nosing down, but still making about 10 knots, trying to follow you, Marshall, stay in column at the moment. Um, How you're going to do that with your bow underwater yeah. is you know, yeah. open to in the fact, they, they swing the turrets, they secure the turrets, they swing them forward again. So she's under sufficient control in that sense and the bow steadily settling. Uh, but it probably the the actual submerging probably takes a few more minutes because initially she does follow your marshal. She's still in formation when the next attack happens, but she is in bad shape. And for some reason, Fuso does not notify your marshal or anybody what happened. But Megami saw what happened and passed her when she slowed down. Uh, but contrary to some previous conceptions 
it's not because there are big fires raging aboard or anything like that. She's basically she's basically getting waterlogged. Right. Uh, and communications can be knocked out for almost the you know, for any, almost any reason. You know, they, they use the tubes back then the uh in the radio Voice tubes. tubes. So yeah. the shock tubes. Or yeah, radio right. tubes, yeah. Exactly. Sure. yeah. So it's easy enough to explain where communications got cut off. Uh, but that, it's not a sign of a out of action yet. Yeah. I was just gonna say, you know, the, the classic rendition of Uso's thinking. Uh, you know, the the one I grew up with as a kid was okay. that she she broke in half and that both of her halves were, you know, floating along and on fire for a long time. And I got to tell you, even as a kid, that didn't make a damn bit of sense to me, because, again, if you look at, you know, the, the size of this ship's superstructure, if this puppy breaks in half, she's going over, you know, yeah. So yeah. even though it didn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. And as Tony discovered, that's actually one of the big revisions from his book and a, a very important one, that there was not, Fuso's demise is not a fiery one. It's a watery one. She's just, mm -hmm. she, again, she's an older combatant. She cannot resist this sort of underwater damage. And as a result of that, there's massive flooding in her forward part and she's going down. Yeah. Can, can you guys gotta... just, go, go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. What I can say is just trying to stay in formation while she's submerging reminds me of the old submarine joke. Any ship can be a submarine once. <laughs> right. Right. That's right. Right. That's very true. That is very and true. The other thing to realize here is the other hit was clearly a boiler room hit. And that's why she slowed down to 10 knots. They've lost some of their steam power. But clearly her engines remained in operation. And though it's getting ahead of the story, her propellers are still turning when she sinks. So, mm -hmm. well, it. Let, let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about her sinking and, and don't worry about the, about the, about the time, you know, oh. out of context or whatever, but oh, let's, let's okay. talk about her sinking here. Uh, what what okay. happens? So she fought, tries to follow the, the force up straight during the next attack. When they all evade to the right, Luso turns right with them. That's the last time she's under real control. Cause after that, she starts slowly circling back South and slowing down and, and what, what we learned for the survivors, what's happening is she's listing more and more to starboard and starting to corkscrew. You probably remember about the Titanic. It started to go right and left as you start to lose start to lose uh, stability when you get to that negative stability point from so much flooding and when her bow submerges. What happens is around 340, she submerges the bow entirely. The strain causes the, to buckle a little behind the pagoda. And it literally pitches the giant 44 meter pagoda overboard. And then she buckles and d noses down where her stern comes up, where the propellers are still turning and goes down. So you battleship sunk by just destroyer torpedoes alone. And with some help from the bomb the day before, uh, goes down at 0340 ish around that time. Uh, we know that time more from the American accounts, but the, uh, the best Japanese survivor also estimated 40 minutes after being hit is when Fuso sank, capsized mm -hmm. the and sank. Uh, so the pagoda has fallen overboard with a great crash. Uh, this will matter that later, but um, it's fallen over with a great crash. Then the buckled wreck, but still in one piece. This is crucial. It's what John was alluding to. She did not break in half, let alone two halves fall down. Still in one piece, kind of jackknife. She breaks in half and sinks. Her bow may have even hit the bottom of the straight. She has a link to it. So maybe that's where the buckling happens. Mm -hmm. But here's what happens next. Because of the buckle, a huge, massive spill of her fuel oil happens. And that, for some reason, maybe just the bending her sparks or something, catches fire almost immediately and forms a giant bonfire around the sinking stern. Okay? Uh, for what? For just a few minutes, the stern is still sticking up, surrounded by all this bonfire flames and you can see the propellers and then she sinks turns out she was forced to be able to see that you know confuse the hell out of it because they're right. arriving from the south just as Lucy was sinking that's what's not been well understood that might yeah. be a good point so. yeah Ugly. so and, and, and bad for the survivors of the water is what i was going to say too i mean yeah it's, yeah it's, one said roasting like beans yeah yeah, that's an ugly image. And obviously, anybody that was in the pagoda uh, superstructure when it gets uh, launched over the side of the ship, essentially, that that's not a good look either. So, 
Yeah, the, the net result is that the, the crew account or the crew complement numbers are all over the map. I've seen figures between 1,600 and 1,900, but only 10 of these guys are going to survive at the end of the day. So this is really, really wow. ugly. This, yeah, it's a Titanic is what it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. Jesus. In terms of body count. Yeah. That, is, that is insane. Yeah. yeah, 10 survivors from the crew of the battleship. That's yeah. not quite, but very close to Hood-esque. Right. Yeah. Really, and we're is. just about really to get is. it again. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. it's it. We ain't done. We ain't, we done. ain't done. Thank nope. you, Captain Coward. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, man, he delivers right here. I tell you, his other destroyers also get into the fight. Specifically, one at zero three ten USS McDermott DD six seven seven and USS Monson DD seven ninety eight unleash their torpedoes. 20 torpedoes head for Nishimura's force, and he rightly ordered evasive action. Failing to hold his evasive action maneuvers long enough, however, the American fish connected with their targets. Three torpedoes fired by McDermott hit destroyer Yamagumo, eviscerating the ship, absolutely destroying her, sinking her in three minutes. Another McDermott torpedo hits Michio amidships, causing that destroyer to go dead in the water. She sank about 15 minutes later. Yet another McDermott torpedo scored when Asagumo was hit in her bow. McDermott's salvo was the most successful American destroyer strike of the entire war. Now, now, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. This is a five, this is a, a quintuple mount, right? Yeah, but she has two yes. of them. But she's got she two, has two of them. So yeah. she shoots 10 torpedoes with five known hits. Yeah. Yes. That's good shooting in anybody's book. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Especially when you consider what torpedoes didn't do earlier in the war. This is rather amazing. So true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we no have kidding. solved our torpedo problems. Yes. We, we have fixed the sploders. The sploders yeah, now work. Yeah. Big time. Big time. Not to be outdone, USS Monson scored when her torpedoes hit Yama Yamashiro on her port quarter at 0322. Yamashiro's captain flooded her magazines for turrets five and six as to render them impervious to the fire inside her. Uh, Tony, what is this damage that, that the battleship suffers right here? Can you get into that a little bit? Can you get into some detail here? What happened is uh, when Monson's torpedo hit the port quarter, a fire broke out. I'm not exactly even sure why the, the, the survivors didn't make clear of, but they made clear that there was a there was a threat to the aft magazines enough for the captain to order them flooded at the lower level as a precaution. The turrets remained operational, but they had, would have to make do with what they had loaded. Uh, but it didn't. But Marshall goes out of her way to signal it does. It's no impediment to battle cruising. Doesn't even slow her down. The flooding of the magazines was just a precaution. Uh, this sal What's interesting about this salvo is it's in the same salvo that, as he described, had just taken out th three Japanese destroyers and the division flagship of, the, of Division 4. Mishishio is the division flagship. And not only is it a, a big score, this is actually removing the Japanese's best offensive power, torpedo attack, from them all in one blow. It mm. cannot be, it's impossible to overstate the importance of this torpedo attack. You alluded to in the first segment that actually Coward's attack may have been the most decisive of the battle. It seems like it is. I mean, by any measure, because sank a battleship outright. That's Fusa. Uh, sank two destroyers outright, Yamagumo and Mishishio. Uh, Asagumo crippled, though, though in the most battle sense of the word, Asagumo remains in battle. She even fires a torpedo, so she's not out of action. But that's the situation you have. Their greatest offensive power is already deprived of them just when they're going to need it, when more destroyer attacks lay ahead, let alone any chance of firing at only those cruisers and battleships. Right. It's, it's, it really is incredible. So, Bill, break it down for us. Oh, uh, coward's dead. Go, go ahead, Tony. Go ahead, Tony. I should have mentioned. Uh, Monson or McDermott, it's probably Monson giving the angle, may have got a hit on Fuso too. On her port quarter, there's an unexplained torpedo hole. What looks like a torpedo hole. Uh, that's the only time you didn't really think it would have happened is when they all were broadside turning right to avoid Monson and McDermott's attack. Maybe she pegged Fuso on the starboard in the port quarter at the same time. And that accounts for seeming to circle after that before she sinks. And Tony, you're talking about when they discovered the wreck in 2017. Mm -hmm. they, they discovered that 
that hole. Right. Found, found she's jackknifed on the bottom in kind of a switchblade form with the bow section pointing north and the stern section pointing southwest, kind of in a switchblade form. The pagoda's north of that. Well, there's a there's what I mean a big hole, so it looks like a torpedo hole. It doesn't look like structural collapse or anything in the port quarter. You see it in the Drain the Oceans episode that talks about blue stuff. Uh, mm. The so um, I haven't had time to study that in detail yet. But the only attack that seems to fit is the Monson McDermott attack. Maybe the kill and the run to Beals attack a little later could have also flicked through the damage. But it's just worth mentioning. They may have scored even more than drill lost. It, it's incredible because, I mean, again, keep in mind, for those watching and or listening, Coward was never even a part of Oldendorf's initial plan. Coward inserts himself right. you know, and, and was, and was welcomed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was welcomed by Ole, but he wasn't even a part of the initial plan. And here he comes in here with his guys. And, I mean, they just absolutely lay waste to the Japanese. Bill, can you summarize what Desron 54 and then later Desron 24, what do they do? This Because the destroyers aren't done here. Mm-hmm. No, they're not. And again, Deseron 54 was the one here to the east. And we're going to talk about Deseron 24 to the west in a moment. And both of these attacks, are, they're sequential, but they're, you know, destroyers in both. So 54's attack was, even though, as you said, Seth, they weren't part of the original plan, was brilliant in execution and results. In a squadron's attack, they had sunk Fuso, Yamagumo, and Machisio uh, while damaging Asagumo heavily and putting hits on Yamashiro, Coward's aggressive command and his planning and execution were a thing of beauty and honestly was the killing blow of the fight before the big ships even got into the scuffle. Now, Desron 24, this is a different squadron, launched their attack on the western side of the channel at the severely depleted Japanese formation. By now, only Yamashiro, Mogami, and Shigure were in formation. Like Coward's group before them, Desron 24 attacked in two separate formations, two lines abreast, in essence. At 0331, USS Killen, which was DD 593, launched torpedoes, of which some of those deep torpedoes hit Yamashiro port side amidships. The hit slowed Yamashiro to a crawl at five knots, although her damage control parties eventually got her back up to 18 knots in short order. So this is already starting to turn into another conflagration, Seth. Yeah. And Tony, you had something you wanted to say about uh, Yamashiro's speed. That, that this 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 hit, it, it's near one of her uh, boiler rooms, is it not? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, it went into an engine room, not the boiler engine. room. So this is, yeah. At the time, uh, all the all the accounts knew that Yamashiro had slowed to almost five knots after that torpedo hit, uh, but then built up speed again, as Bill said, uh, to eighteen knots again, pretty quick. So it was a pretty fast recovery. But with so little information available, even the, you know the few survivors, most of them were forward or midships, uh, didn't really know uh, what had happened. The wreck now reveals where the torpedo was. No, but so it's more under the mainmast area. So it's an engine room hit, boiler yeah. room hit or engine room hit. Either one would have accounted for what we see. But now yeah. we can kind of say what happened. She lost the use of one of her port engines, maybe both, uh, but is able to crank up on the starboard once again to back to 18 knots uh, and does. Uh, what's interesting is there may have been another torpedo hit on the port bow at the same time because Megami claimed the torpedo hit was on the port bow. The wreck shows a very damaged bow that's even mm-hmm. buckled. But it's not mentioned, and it's not mentioned afterward. It's just a, it's a product of Nagami's report and the wreck. Hmm. Well, I mean, you, you can you can understand that if some, some not everything's going to be recorded when there's utter uh, chaos yeah, aboard these the ships at this present time. Not a thinking report or anything. It's yeah. Just a few survivors. So she is going to be hit. Yamashiro is going to be hit by another torpedo at zero four zero seven near her starboard engine room, and two yeah, more from fire. you. Uh, say again. During the gunfire battle. Yeah. Right, right. And then two more from USS Newcomb, DD-586, hit her at 0411 on her starboard side. Uh, these final attacks, as you were saying, were made by the U.S. destroyers just as the gunnery portion of the fight is beginning. Now, I put this in the notes, and I would love to hear you guys riff on this. Fuso goes down by two torpedoes, possibly three. 
Yamashiro absorbs a lot. And we'll, we'll get to the gunfire here in just a minute. Why the discrepancy in the two sisters when one goes down with a whimper and the other one goes down fighting like a lion? What 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 the heck happened here? Any idea? Uh, for my for my take, I think it's because Fuso's Fuso had cumulative damage from that bomb hit multiplied by that torpedo hit. I think it's kind okay. of sinister and hasn't been recognized. Hmm. Uh, that with a flooded forecastle, as Masashi's experience shows, you things get really messy and unstable pretty quick especially for a ship of the Fuso's age, she's leaking and stuff from the torpedo hits, even in undamaged compartments. Watertight integrity. Uh, those may be familiar with it at, at Pearl Harbor. The Nevada partly founders after the attack of Pearl, Pearl Harbor, surely from just progressive flooding, getting through conduits and weakened watertight doors and stuff, well beyond the damage area. Well, I think something like that's happening on Fuso's forecastle area. She also has a hit in the boiler room area, which floods that whole width you know, near the near under the stack. So if she does have a third torpedo hit added just a little bit later to the stern, that's going to create a lot of this kind of stuff and flooding on both ends. Yeah. Uh, Yamashiro's behavior later, uh, so far we see until she's sunk, until she's hit by torpedoes right before the end, notice that the only really hard, serious hit is the one in the engine room. But an engine room can absorb damage. It just gets knocked out. Uh, so in a way, I think Yamashiro's damage is less threatening to her till the gunfire battle torpedo hits, the ones that do finish her off. Let John uh, tie in on something. No, I wasn't going to say anything else. I mean, the only thing I'm thinking Agreed. about here is, um, like, if, if you look at the, the opening stages of the war when Prince of Wales and Repulse were sunk, oh, yes. mm -hmm. um, Repulse was a very handy uh, vessel and was able to evade a number of the torpedo attacks that were, you know, you know these are aerial torpedoes being dropped against her. But I tell you what, when when uh, I, I think it's Genzan group finally connected with Repulse, she thinks right now, you know, because, again, ships of this vintage just really didn't have the ability to absorb underwater damage. Um it, 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 so yeah, yeah, Mashiro gets kind of lucky here in that she takes one in the engine room and you know she's able to absorb that in a sense. Uso taking her damage so far forward, probably outside of the protective, uh, the armored box, means that you get this asymmetric trim on the front, much like what we see happening in Musashi. I've, I got a ton of water in my bow and I, I can't, I, I just can't absorb it. It's over. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's rather astonishing that one can take such a beating and the other one just kind of yeah down flops she goes. over and dies right yeah yeah anyway. it really is so um, before we get to what everybody wants to hear of course which is the gunfight talk about the you know, I mean let's be real talk talk, talk about the J Japanese formation guys what is what what does it look like right now what is Nishimura's formation if there is one, it's, it's, what it's, is it yeah, it's, like? hardly, it's hardly worthy of the name of a formation. I mean, he's down to three ships, and one of them is already. Four. Oh, that's right. You're right. You're right. Because yeah, yeah Askubo still with him. Askubo still is still floating for the time being. Um, but in terms of any sort of cohesion, I mean, you know, Shima's force was never really coordinated with his either. And and yeah, at this point, Nishimura's got, you know, a badly damaged battleship and Shigure. I mean, and he he has no idea what what is lying in wait for him just up just up this straight. Tony, yeah. anything on it? Uh it's also bears in mind of adding to that is uh Nishimura had sent a signal all ships proceed independently to the attack. He was mm -hmm. aware that the formation was shattered. So you have Yamashiro, Shigure, Megami, and Osagamo initially is following. She's able to make better than 12 knots or so, so it's persisting in the attack. Because she just has a smashed bow. Japanese destroyers are American ones too. Uh, often when they lost their bow, they stayed in action. Right. You know, they were pretty right. tough ships, actually. Uh, and the same thing happens here. Osagamo was still underway. She even fires her torpedoes. We now know for sure, because the wreck, they were gone. But they, she had fired them. But so she continues in the fight to the second phase, right before the gunfire phase, which I, which you're about to describe. Uh, so initially, you have four ships proceeding independently. But it's hardly a formation now. Well, and that's that's why I was going to say, 
anytime you run into a situation where the commanding officer says proceed independently, that's yeah. your clue that the crap has hit the fan. You yeah. know, things are <laughs> just in disastrous shape right now. And now they're they're about to get worse. The the yeah. appropriate this, this, the, when, this is the same time Nishimura says Fluso uh yeah uh, you know can rejoin as soon as possible, you know, top yeah. speed. Unaware uh, that <laughs> The only yeah, thing that yeah. was capable yeah. of rejoining is the bottom. Right. So her only speed is vertical. Yes, that is <laughs> he's, assume, he's assuming she's limping behind, crippled somewhere. He's figured that out by now. But he figured mm -hmm. she might be able to rejoin and hear him. You know, mean uh, never understood that. You know, it's completely out of action with him. Like, yeah. yeah. As uh, as as the saying goes, the defecation is about to hit the ventilation, boy. and boy, is it. So as McDermott, USS McDermott, cleared the area, one of her torpedo men, a guy named Roy West, looked in the direction of the big ships. Something had caught his eye, a flicker on the horizon, and then another, and then another. West said to no one in particular, quote, wow, would you look at that, unquote. The sight he was looking at were several crimson streaks flashing across the sky in slow, lazy arcs, quote, like meteors, he said later. Several more flashed immediately, and then he could hear a low, throaty rumble like distant thunder. Another torpedo man standing by watching the sight said, quote, that's the big boys. The heavies are shooting, unquote. Indeed, they are. Bill, take us through it. What's going on? Well, <clears throat> Admiral Oldendorf had been monitoring the ambush on the radio via radar reports and, of course, the very late PT boat radio reports. He knew when the destroyers were attacking and could see the flashes from their torpedo hits. And the Japanese returned gunfire at, the di at a distance. He wanted his destroyers, those of Desron 56, to clear the area completely before he would open fire with his heavies. But as the Japanese crossed the 20,000 yard range, he felt they were getting too close. So at 0340, the targets were 20,700 yards from Louisville, Oldendor's flagship. The battleships were chomping at the bit to strike. This is kind of getting close, not kind of, almost danger close for a battleship. West Virginia was in the lead of the column, followed by Maryland, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and California. Yes, those names sound familiar, folks. As the Japanese drew to within 15,600 yards from Louisville, Oldendorf gave the order, barking, all right, give the order to open fire. Very creative with that order. <laughs> Oldendorf turned around and grasped the rail on Louisville, awaiting her turrets to shoot, Seth. Yeah. In an instant, the night sky turned into daylight as the cruisers opened fire. And my God, we've talked about these six-inch gun cruisers before. We're about to get into it again. Uh, 0351, Louisville opened fire. Seconds later, Denver, Minneapolis, and Columbia joined in the nighttime song. Portland, too, a minute later, let her eight-inch batteries roar at a target some 15,000 yards distant. That target was the Japanese battleship. Yamashiro. American cruisers, Shropshire had yet to fire, but she was about to get into it here, absolutely poured fire into the Japanese ships. Over 3,100 rounds were fired by the cruisers on the left flank of the American formation alone. USS Columbia, CL-56, as I put in the notes, would have done the old Helena Proud, the original machine gun cruiser. Columbia alone fired an astonishing 1,147 rounds from the 12 barrels of her six-inch main battery. Holy cow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, that I, is I just incredible. chuckle because this, this is just how the Americans have been solving their problems in this war since the beginning. You know, yeah. like... Whether it's, whether it's airplanes yeah, or exactly. guns. Yeah, it's just give me a truckload of shells and I'm going to shoot them at the other guy. So, yeah, this yeah. this is what we would expect uh, to have. It's, still, it's incredible. Aboard Maryland, an observer wrote, quote, suddenly there was a great deal to see <laughs> as all cruisers joined from both sides of the channel. The six-inch light cruisers fired so rapidly, each kept four or five salvos in the air. 
following one another in their beautifully curved trajectories. The 8-inch cruiser fire was more deliberate, but their salvo intervals intervals were amazingly brief, unquote. I mean, this is this shouldn't come as any surprise to to us because we've talked about these things before. But that is it. And eleven hundred rounds of ammunition. Yeah, that's, good. That's a lot of. That's God. a lot of. You know, I'm just thinking too. Uh, you know, on our whole payback angle, we've got Minneapolis here, which of course yes. absorbed two fish at Tassafaranga, so she's got a little bit of of payback, and, and Portland. Two, I think, in some she capacity. Torpedo hit for November 13th. Battle. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. That, that's right. So yeah, there's yep. there's just a lot of a lot of cold dishes being served here. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Yeah. And and this will go back. This what we're about to talk about. Now, this goes back to uh, the conversation from last week when we're talking about Mark 8 versus Mark 3 surface radar searches. So the battleships are literally that you could probably feel them like oh, Come on, damn it. They're getting ready, itching to join in this fight. They were waiting on the order from USS Mississippi. This is Admiral Whaler's flagship. They had yet to receive the word from Mississippi to fire. Why? Because Missy had Mark III surface radar, and she could not range in on Yamashiro. All, all she could pick up were intermittent shell. splashes. Yeah, yeah shell, shell, shell splashes, splashes, exactly. Right. Yeah. She was having an incredibly hard time identifying targets, and she did not relay the order to open fire. Fire. Finally, Rear Admiral Theodore Rudock aboard USS West Virginia, he'd, he'd had enough. Uh, his radar, the Mark 8 radar, had been tracking large target, obviously Yamashiro, for quite some time and were more than sure what they were tracking were hostile, seeing as how he was watching them via radar get it with the range at 22,800 yards west virginia open fire with a full eight gun 16 inch 45 caliber broadside kaboom 30 seconds later west virginia's gunnery officer was heard to chuckle and announced to all who could hear that weavy's first salvo was indeed a hit her second salvo was also more than likely a hit quote Explosions on their targets, forecastle and foremast structure, unquote. Observers aboard the American battle wagons could see through binoculars that the target was obviously a Japanese battleship. Yamashiro's massive pagoda superstructure stuck out like a sore thumb. But West Virginia is not the only one to open fire, is she, Bill? No, she's not. And by the way, forecastles pronounced forecastle in David's language. Folks, the Navy folks Foxel. listening or watching would would be a cringe. Yes. cringe if they didn't hear me correct that. So here we go. The American battle line slowly erupted in fire after Weavey, West Virginia, let loose. At 0355, California opened fire with her 14-inch main battery, followed by Tennessee at 0356, one minute later. The 14-inch gun vessels attempted to conserve their AP ammunition, by not firing full broadsides, instead letting loose with six gun salvos and then another and then another, expending 132 rounds of armor-piercing projectiles between the two of them. So Weavey, on the other hand, had no such inhibitions regarding ammunition expenditure. <laughs> nope. In an 18-minute fury, which included a course change to come about, it's called attack or a jibe, depending on whether you're going into the wind or away from the wind. Rotate turrets, require the target and open, acquire the target and open fire again. The Pearl Harbor survivor threw 93 rounds of 16 inch AP at Yamashiro, letting loose with a full broadside every 40 seconds. Imagine that, guys. Six every 40 seconds in what would be history's last battleship versus battleship fight. West Virginia was getting her money's worth with every blast, Seth. I just oh, wanted to ask Tony, cool. <laughs> I, what, what did the Japanese accounts say about the uh, initial accuracy of the American battleship gunnery? Do, do they corroborate that Weavey creamed her with the first salvo? Yeah, they do. That Repeated hits forward in an all-around of the armored conning tower, but they also stress, you know, despite the buffeting, like like in a hurricane, the the uh, compass bridge of Yamashiro remained intact. And Nishimura remained seemingly unruffled, and her paymaster, who is the senior survivor, standing right behind him. It's like, 
they were just enduring it and just, okay, the enemy's dead ahead. And they had a good fix from their radar detectors. And I think your Marshall's radar, it's debated whether or not it was working properly or not, but they had a, they had detect, they had a good bearing on the left flank cruisers anyway, as well as American shore column attacking at that time. So once they were acquired the target, they, they resolved to do the same thing, just return fire, heavy battery fire on, and unmask their guns. Not long after making the turn, which I'm sure you'll get into, that's when they suffered the first memorable hit is number three turrets taken out. But yes, um, they corroborate the American battleship towers, the first ones are all straddling or direct hits. I mean, uh, Megami, the same thing that's near, near, in fact, Megami opens distance because she's getting a lot of the overs from them. Uh, the crew. <laughs> that's a bad feeling. Yeah. I'm not doing nothing. <laughs> You're shooting at that guy, and I'm taking your shells. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, we we were talking last week, John. You asked which which American battleships had a Mark III, and I said Mississippi and Pennsylvania, and I drew a blank. The other one was USS Maryland. She had the okay. Mark III, and that'll get to the point here. Maryland, Mississippi, and Pennsylvania were all equipped with the older Mark III fire control, and as such, had a difficult time ranging in on the target that their cousins equipped with the Mark 8 were absolutely pummeling. Uh, Maryland. Cali, uh, Tennessee, and Weavey. Correct. Those, those are the Mark 8 ships. Okay. Thanks. Correct. Maryland was desperate to get into the fight and unable to range in on Yamashiro herself, ranged in on the shell splashes, which is what Mark 3s could do at that kind of distance, uh, and finally opened fire and shot 48 rounds of 16-inch AP at the target. Mississippi fired only one salvo, and Pennsylvania didn't fire at all. Um, through all the large caliber shell fire, the cruisers continued their absolute rain of shell fire on the Japanese ships, who by now were returning fire rather uh, rather blindly, albeit. Uh, the left flank cruisers began firing at Yamashiro at 0351 Portland. Seeing that Yamashiro was blanketed with shell fire, shifted fire to Mogami, while Denver Track Shiguri, Shiguri and inadvertently hit USS Albert W. Grant instead. As this group, this is the form, last group of American destroyers, were slow in clearing the area. This is exactly what Oldendorf had feared, and it right. actually does come to fruition right here. Denver pounds, or at least we think it's Denver. It probably was Denver pounds Albert W. Grant here with shell fire. So on the left flank, USS Phoenix CL-46 let loose with a full 18-gun salvo every 15 seconds, while <laughs> Boise, now pouring it into Yamashiro, was ordered to make sure to make her fire more deliberate, quote unquote, as she was blowing through ammunition at an astonishing rate. Shropshire finally gets into the fray, beginning her work with slow salvos and then opening up with everything she had after she had changed course and began a westerly run across the strait. You know, there's some there's some photographs of this event and it, you know, I mean, it does look in sporadic places on, on the uh, horizon looks like daylight. But I can you even imagine what that must have looked like at night? I mean, good God, all that shell fire just tearing through the night sky. John, you were, you look like you're about to say something. Oh, I'm just no, I'm just uh, as as you just trying to envision what that would be like. Incredible. I can't. The, the ranges are significantly longer than they were uh, at the, the, the battleship fight in Savo Island. I mean, uh, Kirishima and, and Washington were about 8,000 yards apart, 7,800 when they were getting into it. But again, just given the sheer volume of fire going on here and the enormous advantage that we have in our smaller combatants, and all of it's converging, of course, from you know, yeah. from front and both sides, you know, all onto this little pocket of of three or four enemy ships. You know, say good night, Johnny. That's just yeah, yeah. It's it's incredible. Remarking on that shell fire, Captain Smoot aboard their retreating American destroyers said, "Quote: The devastating accuracy of this gunfire was the most beautiful sight I had ever witnessed." Unquote. The arch, any quotes again, the arch line of tracers in the darkness looked like a continual stream of railroad cars going over a hill. No target could be observed at first, then shortly there would be fires and explosions and another ship would be accounted for, unquote. Just an absolute beatdown of epic proportions. John, you wanted, or uh, I'm sorry, Tony, you wanted to say something about Shropshire? As, uh, Yamasho gets a good fix on Shropshire and she, she has the unwelcome distinction being one of the ones that Yamashiro is straddling. Uh, and uh, 
uh, along with the Denver, I believe, is the other. Uh, because the cruisers, because of the same thing you call the machine gun fire, also gave mm-hmm. the Japanese plenty of time to lock in on them. It was nearly as good as a radar fix or a visual fix because it's so continuous. So they exactly. used it. So that's why exactly. our attention tends to go to them. Uh, exactly. And the Australians take some pride in that kind of in a backward, you know, in a, in, a, in a ironic sense that they're just, you know, Shropshire had her big oh. moment because it's, she's the one that gets some direct attention. And it's, a, uh, so uh, it's just interesting in that sense. And, and Arunta's torpedo attack earlier may have been, may have scored too, as we mentioned. So the Australian role in the battle is notable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, can you guys enlighten us on some of this damage that Yamashiro's know, sure is taking right now from shell fire? We'd already talked about some of the torpedo damage. Lay it on us with the with this. I mean, this. I mean, she is she's getting beat to live in hell. Can you can you describe what the heck's going on in here? Uh, John, describe what happened in detail that we kind of know about Kirishima to give an idea of what happens when shells hit, and that'll give you a bit of a picture. But during this time, Yamashiro is taking heavy caliber shell hit after heavy caliber shell hit, knocks out number three turret. She swings to port to unmask her own battery. So she's firing full broadsides too, minus number three turret for a while. Uh, while taking all these hits, very Karishima like you can imagine. One of the tragedies of when they found the wreck, um, the unfortunate things is since it's upside down on the bottom, all the any idea of all the shell hits will still remain forever unknown. You know, uh, it, re- it did reveal answers about where torpedoes hit, which had its own value. But shell hits are obscured because they're buried in the mud. So we will never know how what kind of pasting Yamashita was taking as far as where they hit and what they hit. But if you look at Kirishima, it's very informative. It's also an old ship, uh, kind of like the uh, Yamashita in that regard, too. So it's very instructive. But we know that there were multiple hits and fires breaking out everywhere. Damage control had to be directed to this fire, to this fire, to this fire. But we also know that the main battery turrets remained in action. The last one to be knocked out, number one remains in action until she sinks. Mm-hmm. So number three is knocked out early. The two aft turrets would have were unmasked, so they would have expended their ammunition quick uh, because that's their opportunity. They don't have, a, you know, they have, they have flooded magazines from aft from the Right. Um, the damage control measure. But during this time, the Yamashita secondary battery is vigorously engaging both the destroyers and the cruisers. So that's what's going on under this. So this is where, John, plug in what happened to Karishma. Just give a little of that visual, even if you revisit sure. it. Sure. I mean, it basically, you know, the, so, the ex post facto um, analysis of, of the shoot against Karishma, you know, again, when I was growing up, I was always taught that she was hit between six and nine times. And it turns out that she probably got hit two dozen times. And a lot of those hits were underwater because what would happen was a shell would hit slightly in front of it and would just dive into her, uh, into and through her armored uh, belt and right into her engineering spaces or what have you. To me, again, the fact that Yamashiro is hit by this volume of shells and manages to sink uh, relatively quietly, as opposed to being blown into, you know, smithereens by a magazine hit, is another sort of minor miracle. But it, there is just no way that a ship of this vintage is going to be able to absorb that quantity of of heavy caliber gunfire and and remain upright for any more than just a few minutes. And that's exactly what happens. I, 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 I would it, argue. Oh, that, go ahead, Bill. If that waterline hit you're talking about is an HE round it's going to react very differently than if it's an uh armor piercing round right because right. the arm piercing will will penetrate the water yeah and it's the, impact the ship. The yeah, AT exactly may right. explode on the water right yeah and these are all obviously our ships are all firing ap at this point so okay yeah the, the other the other problem with with those those short hits as well is that they're all going to hit on her uh, she's she's turned to port to unmask her batteries, so she's getting she's getting clobbered on her starboard side, which is going to lead then to asymmetric flooding. It's all going to be on her starboard side, and if you're a damage control person, that is not what you want to be seeing. Nope. And 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 reg- regarding the hits 
that that Yamashiro is absorbing right now. You know, you said a battleship of her vintage would never survive it. I I would argue that any ship would be hard pressed to survive this kind of beating. I mean, this is yeah, yeah. This is epic. Six six look at the models. Yeah, that'd be the only exception, maybe. Right. Yeah, six battleships to one. I mean, yeah. Again, say goodnight, Johnny. It's 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 over. Even before anyway. And Nishimura concludes that too. Uh, because during the, as it right before she unmasks her battery and stuff, he sends a final telegram. He says, "Tell all commands, Giyokusai, we proceed till totally annihilated." Right. No, yeah, I'm not coming Giyokusai. back, and I'm doing my mission to divert the forces. Right. And the Japanese term is for it is Giyokusai, and that's the uh, that's the word they also use for those suicidal bond by charges that ended Saipan, right, and Iwo Jima yeah. when the last. Mm-hmm. Forces that's on out, and right. that's yeah. message he said instructs to be that's, sent. That's the formal Japanese way of saying uh, our goose is cooked, and yeah, yeah this is the yeah. end. Yeah. Farewell. Perfect way to put it, Bill. What's going on aboard Mogami right now? Well, the the American fire looked like lights turning on one after another in a dark room. As she nears the battle line, towers of water begin to erupt around her, desiring to unleash. Her long lances, Mogami turned to unmask her tubes, and as she did so, she came almost head on at USS Daily, DD 19, 519. The two ships raced past one another, firing at each other at a range of about 5,000 yards, two and a half miles, folks. The American destroyers poured fire into the Midway veteran, and fires began to sprout aboard the cruiser as Mogami turned and try to get away, the cruisers opened fire on her. Six and eight inch shell fire rained down on the cruiser as she tried in vain to unmask her tubes, which she eventually did do, and eventually get away from the firestorm of shells. But by 353-0353, Mogami was on fire and still taking hits. At 0402, a shell probably fired from Portland, exploded on the bridge, killing all officers, including the captain. Other hits to the engine room slowed her to a crawl. Of course, speed is life in these kinds of battles, guys. Yeah. Yeah. I I have a real soft spot in my heart for Mogami. Um, You know, having written a book on Midway, as as we did, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Mogami is an example of good damage control on the part of the Japanese. And, you know, the fact she was badly beaten up in, in... at midway as well and for the people on our our channel who don't know it they they tore off her aft turrets because they had been demolished um, by fires and they basically they rebuilt her as an aircraft cruiser and so her whole aft end is a is a flight deck for float planes and that sort of thing she's not really the kind of asset that you would want in a fight like this and yet here she is uh at the end of her career and just yeah just getting gunned down Hey, Tony, can you can you get into some detail about the the beating that Mogami's taking right here? Can you tell us about what's going on aboard ship? Uh, as she tries to position to launch her torpedoes, she makes a circular maneuver to uh, pull away. First of all, she pulled away from Yamashiro because that's where all those overs are going. And then she <laughs> maneuvers to do a turn and fire torpedoes around while also <laughs> doing a retirement motion. Uh, it, it's a standard doctrinal attack that they do. Uh, but during this time, she's taking hit after hit after hit that explodes some of her own torpedoes in their tubes before she can launch them. Others she's able to launch. Uh, the the hit on the bridge was mentioned. There's the the, the flight deck aft is getting set afire and smashed. Forward turrets taking blows. And here's here's a here's a new fact since since my book was published. I didn't know this at the time, but from new research from uh, American records available now that were found on Maryland. Robert Lundgren thinks that Maryland was also rounded on Megami. And this would make a lot of sense because that means those two shells that went through her bridge and killed everybody but didn't detonate, they're, they're armor piercing from Maryland probably. Oh, uh, that's a notion, isn't it? Yeah. That would make sense. Yeah. yeah. And Maryland yeah. was having difficulty rounding in, according to Robert Lundgren. It's actually Megami's. The center's on because she followed the splashes, and those are around Megami. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, makes perfect yeah. sense. Yeah, bat- a battleship <laughs> shell into your bridge, that'll make a mess of things, right? Killed the yeah, captain, just- almost all the senior officers of it, uh, in one blow, but they didn't detonate. So it's not like you have the bridge blown to bits. And that sounds like battleship shells. USS mm-hmm. San Francisco at Guadalcanal Barroom Brawl. Just ask her. Right. Yeah. Yeah, same, same kind thing. of thing. Same thing. So after receiving word that his destroyers uh, were receiving friendly fire at this time, Oldendorf, Oldendorf ordered ceasefire at 0409 aboard USS Albert W. Grant that we mentioned earlier. The target of the friendly fire, a shell hit Grant's fantail, knocking out the fi- knocking out the number five five-inch turret. Uh, more shells from both sides. So she's actually receiving fire from both sides. Punched into the forward stack and the forward boiler room, forward engine room, gun mounts, and various interior compartments. The destroyer would be towed out of the area later, her casualties mounting to 38 men killed in action and a further 104 wounded. Not all of the hits were friendly, as we were just saying, although more than half were six-inch shell hits from Amer- American cruisers, more than likely USS Denver. Um, mm-hmm. I have in the notes here, discretion is the better part of valor. And Admiral Shima was probably more than likely aware of this saying, what is Shima doing right now as this is just, the, the fight has turned into an absolute annihilation. Yeah, what is Shima doing? It's, it's, it's time to, it's time to get out of Dodge pretty clearly. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's what he's doing, Tony. Uh, when the ceasefire happens, Nishimura, uh, his flags at Mashal is still underway, still, still, if not in fighting shape, is still going on. So they turn, they turn to starboard and start to retire. So does the Megami and so does the Shiguri. So they all start to retire because they're aware they Shima has entered the radio telephone net by now, and they know Nachi is just about to arrive. So they're going to meet her. Yamashiro, after having successfully made this turn, and his mate of 180 is now headed down the strait, gets more torpedo hits from American destroyers and capsizes the port and sinks abruptly. Mm. This is after the ceasefire that Odendorf had ordered. And Tennessee observes her on the radar shrink and vanish. In other words, uh, clearly marking where she sank, gets the time right, everything matches the Japanese accounts very well. Mm. At the time that happened, Nachi is inside of her coming north. The sub for 190420. I'll get to Shima as we go on later. But at this moment, when Namashiro sinks, Megami is staggering, all in fire, bridge knocked out, not even really under control, staggering south. Shiguri, an interesting thing when you're talking about the railroad cars and all this, Shiguri's experience is instructive too. Because the destroyer at first tries to make an attack, because the doctrine calls for you do you do not open gunfire until you can fire your torpedoes. Right. Shiguri is trying to charge the left flank cruisers to launch a torpedo attack, but it's been so surrounded by shell splashes, gyro compass is knocked out, the ship is shaking so much, she can't even retire, turn to fire torpedoes. Any turn, with, there's so many water around, can't even maneuver. That's how much they described how bad the avalanche of shells around wow. it was. So she turned, she finally succeeds in turning around. Uh, Gets a shell hit in the starboard quarter in the fantail, an eight-inch shell. Puts a hole in Shiguri's stern and damages her rudder where it becomes flaky after that. So this is what is happening after Oldendorf has ordered the ceasefire. Yamashiro has tried to retire, but capsized and sinks. Shiguri is wobbling without rudder control. Megami is in worse shape without rudder control. They're trying to move south. Asagamo had already turned around. Having fired all torpedoes, the better part of the battle was to retreat and down to nine miles. So it's limping down toward the Fuso wreck by this time. And the Fuso wreck means the fire. That huge oil fire is still burning. But the Fuso's gone. It's sunk under by this time. Right. But it would confuse a lot of people because you have the drifting wreck of the Os- Osaguna near. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> absolute, absolute execution and that execution is over pretty much not really but close by sunrise uh oldendorf briefly considered pursuit but possible japanese tor- possible 
more you know, definite Japanese torpedoes, uh, and more importantly, lack of ammunition caused Oldendorf to change his mind. Uh, he issued orders to his destroyers and some of the cruisers to nose their way into the wreckage to search for survivors and lay eyes on the destruction. Uh, on the subject of survivors, Oldendorf said, quote, do not overload your ships with survivors. Search each man well to see that he does not have any weapons. Anyone offering resistance, shoot him. Proceed independently to pick up survivors, unquote. Japanese destroyer Asa Asaguma, as you were saying, Tony, hit by torpedoes, was spotted by cruisers USS Denver and Columbia, who finish her off with shell fire. Um, this, and we're not done, but, but we kind of need to put a bow on this thing here. Bill, this had been a beating of biblical proportions. I mean, one of the few naval battles in history where it was just, it wasn't one-sided, but it was damn near one-sided. Tell us, wrap it up for us here. Well, for the Americans, casualties were extremely light, with the majority of them coming from the friendly fire against Albert W. Grant and her ordeal. Again, the casualty figures between the two battleships, we know that the crews were between 1,600 and 1,900 apiece, so that's, you know, 3,200 to 3,800 men and only about 20 of them live. So just between the two battleships alone, you've you're you on the upper end could be pushing nearly 4,000 4, guys. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Mogami, how many how many get lost aboard her, Tony? Uh, if I remember correctly, it's close to 200. It's not what you'd expect from her piling she takes. Maybe it's saying, forget the figure offhand. Uh, the destroyers, though, suffer horribly. Mrs. Hill has only four survivors, and Yamaguno only has two. Right. Uh, Oh, Asagumo is 40. Okay. So yeah, I yeah, I, I would say that it, it's it's definitely in the neighborhood of four thousand. Has to be. Easily. Yeah. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Well, Oldendorf had done his job and done it perfectly. When looking at his and his ship's performance, save the obvious friendly fire incident on Grant, there is little to nothing to pick apart. The after action report on this one would have been easy. His placement of the ships, his plans, his execution of plans, and his calmness under fire were exactly as one would expect from an officer who had seen as much action as he had at this point. Sergal Straits was truly his finest hour, Seth. Yeah, uh, he reflected years later on the battle. And he said, quote, my theory as an old time gambler, never give a sucker a chance, unquote. <laughs> right. If I may. Go ahead. Uh, just to tie up the one thing so as not to uh, leave it un unaddressed, Seema's force right behind was an hour behind Mr. Murray's force going north. They arrived just as Yamashiro was sinking. He he tries a fire, fire torpedo attack, launches a string of torpedoes at the battle line. But because the southbound Megami is out of control at that time, they make a miscalculation and Nazi slams into Megami. So yeah, they have a collision with Megami. The flagship, Seaman's flagship, is damaged, running into Megami, mostly by Nazi's error. Because of this damage and because of the hopelessness of battle and the burning wrecks, it's very clear to him the situation is hopeless. His staff persuades Shima to retreat. And that they retreat down the strait, along with Shiguri and Megami, and they all get out of the strait in the daylight. Asagun was sunk at sunrise. But it should be mentioned that the follow-up is that Shima's force escapes, except for the light cruiser Bukuma being sunk by air attack. And the and the Megami, the famous Megami, is finally finished off by air attack as they're leaving, but was part of Shima's force by that. So I just wanted to cover the role of Shima's force so that it not be overlooked so people wouldn't be confused by that, yeah. by the non-mention of it, because but it's swiftly covered in that sense. Shiguri seems to have just run away, never even rejoined Shiguri. Uh, Shima, but that's another. Story. Can't really blame her. <laughs> yeah, some some days it's good to just kind of run away. <laughs> yes, yeah. in in the words of Monty Python, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Brave Sir Robin. Away. Yes. Yeah. So, as Oldendorf is having his ships clear the area, he began to receive frantic messages at zero 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 seven zero seven of another action occurring in San Bernardino Strait. Apparently, Japanese battleships had somehow slipped through San Bernardino Strait 
And we're now taking the escort carriers of Rear Admiral Ziggy Sprague's Task Force 77.4.3, better known by their call sign, Taffy 3, under fire. Low on ammunition in some ships, Oldendorf relayed a message to Kincaid and Halsey saying, quote, about 0700 CTU 77.4.3 reported under fire from enemy battleships and cruisers evidently came through San Bernardino during the night. Request immediate airstrike. Also request support from heavy ships. My OBBs low on low in ammunition, unquote. Oops. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. And of course, where are the carriers? <laughs> the world wonders. <laughs> yeah. Dude, the world wonders. Indeed. Exactly. Indeed. So at 0847, Oldendorf receives a reply from Kincaid, quote, please proceed with entire force to a point 25 miles west of point FIN. Be prepared to join escort carriers informing me ETA, unquote. Expected to turn around and save Taffy 3. Oldendorf was in a very tough spot, as I put in the notes, but he would comply as best he could. Now, Tony, you had mentioned that as far as the ammunition was concerned, and this is very true, that some battleships, specifically Mississippi and Pennsylvania, they still had, they didn't have a full load, but they still had plenty of ammunition because Pensy didn't even fire once, and Missy only fired one time that we know of. Uh, Maryland, she shot a bit, but she... You know, the ones that were low on ammunition specifically were West Virginia, California, and Tennessee. They had about damn near unloaded their lockers. They were they were riding high. Um, you know, and it's interesting to think. I mean, again, we we made mention of the top speed of these ships last week, the battleships specifically, the American battleships here. You know, 20 knots downhill, 21 knots maybe with a and wind. Maybe not even that, um, unless yeah. they're willing to potentially do structural damage to her in the process of getting her up there. And that, and that is exactly what I was going to bring up, is that Tony had said that, that Weavey had, had suffered some underwater structural damage when she hit something, and she couldn't even make 20 knots. So it's it, it would be damn near impossible for, for Oli to get there in time to deal with what obviously is Center Force and Carita. What is y'all's opinion on this? Yeah, just from a, a time motion standpoint, no, she's uh, old endorsed, not in a good position to intercede on uh, on anybody's behalf at this point. And you have to think, too, um, that is not the kind of fight that I want to be in either. Taking my 20 knot battle wagons up to go against a Japanese force that has at least a four knot advantage uh, on me and heavier gun power to boot, uh, you know. Yamato has got a very good fire control suite. Pennsylvania sure as hell doesn't. You know, if you're on that Pennsylvania, yeah. yeah, do, do you want to be fighting Yamato in Pennsylvania? I sure don't. <laughs> but, you know, that, that but point better, will be rendered moot. Better than Taffy 3, though, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, again, cry me a river, right? We got to go do what we're going to go do. But, uh, yeah. Nagato probably outclassed all six, too. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I you would like, and you know, we don't do counterfactuals. At least we don't do them very often. And you would like to think that Oldendorf would have given a damn good account of himself, and he, and he more than likely would have. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I don't. It wouldn't have been as one sided as Surigao was. That's for damn sure. Probably not. No, yeah. yeah. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as I put in the note, you the mean, fox was. Oh, go yeah. ahead, Bill. Seth, you mean there's more to this story? No. No, it's over. We're done. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. MacArthur lands on the Philippines and the war ends. War is that it? Everybody knows it's all over. Just mm -hmm. like right mm -hmm. after D-Day, you know, there was no there was nothing after Normandy. You know, the war was nothing over. Happened. Yeah, well, it was boring. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So as I put in the notes, the fox was among the chickens, as the saying goes. Uh somebody, we all know who, had screwed up. That was for certain. Who and why did not matter at this point. Somebody had to save Taffy 3. Uh, their small force was no match for what was now identified as Kirita's center force. Or were they? And we will find that out soon enough in what is going to be called by history, the Battle of Samar next week. Guys, is there anything else you want to add to this beatdown of Nishimura at Surigao Strait by Oldendorf? Anything at all. You know, Tony, you had in the notes, you, you know, 
looking at some of the wreck footage, but uh, but there there's so much that we can learn from this wreck footage. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, just very briefly, as uh, as it ties into battle, after uh, Oldendorf got this word from Kincaid, that's probably why Shima's force survives to escape. I mean, they have a mm -hmm. if a few air escort carrier plane attacks, but those are called back as a as the next action starts. So that's probably why she not even escapes and Shiguri gets away and all that. So for them, it was good news what happened. Uh, so Shima's force gets away uh, mostly back to Manila or, and Shiguri back to Brunei. As far as the wrecks, what, what they revealed it very briefly is that, as said before, the Fuso sank in one piece is a kind of a switchblade on the bottom. The Yamasho also is up to, oh, the Fuso is upside down. It's a switchblade. Understand that. It's an upside down wreck fit. Yamasho is upside down on the bottom. It told us where some of the torpedo hits hit, but all the gunfire damage is hidden. And most interesting, it solved the mystery of Mr. Shio. That destroyer sunk by McDermott is the Grand Slam did happen. McDermott definitely hit Mississippi. Some accounts imply Hutchins finished her off further north. No, Mississippi went down at the same latitude as y y Yamagumo, just as some of the earlier reconstructions suggested. She just found her from her one torpedo hit in the engine room and is on the same latitude as the Yamagumo wreck. So mm -hmm. the, that's what this, the expeditions revealed. Of the, the, uh, the National Museum of the Philippines, you should go look out their website and Facebook page and Robert Kraft's. Uh, Petrel mm -hmm. RV Facebook page, while that covered the covered the wreck explorations in 2017, they're still accessible. Yeah. Cool. We we've mentioned Petrel uh, multiple times because all 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 of us, all four all of us, us had, had, had done work with Petrel uh, in, in one way, shape, or form over the years, and their um, their expeditions and the footage that they have, you know that they recorded that is now available that the pictures that we've seen have just further added to the story and our understanding of these naval fights and it's absolutely invaluable it's ridiculously important ridiculously important yeah. well gentlemen i want to thank personally both of you personally tony thank you very much for being here man i really really appreciate yeah. you being here it was great fun it was great fun yeah Having you so, two weeks in a row, too. I know. <laughs> Man, I tell you, it's amazing how fast a week flies. It when really you does. Stuff yeah. lunch down your face in five minutes. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's Not just like, boom. Change your yeah. clothes. Yeah. Unreal. Unbelievable. My God. My goodness. Yep. So anyway, with that, we want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast, wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. If you want to look at our YouTube channel and watch this very conversation, please do so. If you want to send us a comment or a question, send it to our email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, my name is Seth Perrin, and I want to thank you very much for listening and or watching. John, my friend, thank you for being here with us. It's Thanks always so great fun. Yeah. yeah, it was a good time. Thank you. Tony, again, thank you, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Bill, bring us home. I'm Bill Toady. See you again next week.